Here the uh, producer and director here. <laughs> Go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Bruce Bush. I'm past master of Indiana Harbor Lodge, number 686, here in Highland, Indiana. And also the secretary. And also the secretary. Bruce, tell me about Freemasonry. Freemasonry. Well, Freemasonry means a, a, a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Uh, different people get into it for different reasons. Uh, for myself, I've got a bit of a uh, history with it uh, from the standpoint and legacy, uh, so to speak. My father was a past master uh, in 1955. Uh, I've got two uncles that were past masters in Michigan. Uh, I spent a little time in Demolays growing up when I was a kid in Fairmount. Uh, Spent a lot of time going to lodge uh, functions, uh, suppers, and everything else with uh, uh, my dad. Got kind of interested in it at that time. Initially, I started out uh, Freemasonry, what it means to me. Uh, I started out, I was looking at it from a historical perspective. Uh, I was uh, attracted to the history of Freemasonry, the roots uh, dating back to King Solomon in ancient times. Uh, Jerusalem and Egypt uh, that always interested at me uh, no matter whether it was Masonic or otherwise um, but as time evolved and I got more involved with it uh, it becomes uh, something a little bit more different uh, in my estimation Freemasonry is a place where men of kindred minds and spirits come together to socialize to uh, communicate with one another and to improve themselves in their uh, character and in society. Uh, like I said, it means a lot of different things. Some people just, as I started out, come in for the history value of it. Some of them come in because they believe that it's going to give them uh, specific connections to businesses and uh, career opportunities uh, because of uh, some of the people that are uh, involved with it. Some just uh, use it as a social club to come uh, uh, to the dinners and sit down and commune and, and uh, just socialize with one another and, and with a brotherly love. Uh, for others, it's got a much more deeper meaning. Um, and if you take the teachings and, and uh, of the masonry and try to live by them and include them into your daily life, uh, hopefully you become a better man, that you become a, be a better husband, a better father, uh, a better citizen. Uh, it gives you a lot of moral character and guidance uh, as you progress through the degrees and as you study and research uh, masonry, uh, it means a whole lot of different things. If you need to take a break or anything after a question, just let me know if you want a drink or something. Okay. No problem. <clears throat> what is a past master and are you one? Past master, I am a past master. Past master uh, is a title given to any brother that's uh, served as the worshipful master uh, in the East. Um, to put it in layman's term or in general terms, uh, a worshipful master is, or a past master is a past president of uh, a Masonic Lodge. Uh, for most people that's how I explain it to people that aren't quite familiar and they ask me about the, what your role is and what uh, offices I've held. Uh, I tell them that you know the Worshipful Master is basically the president of uh, the Lodge at that point in time. He's the leader. Uh, past Master uh, is someone who has served in that role for a full year. Uh, he's also someone that uh, the members come to uh, many times for guidance and counsel and uh, some insight as to the workings uh, and the laws, bylaws of the lodge and Grand Lodge. And uh, generally, they're quiet leaders. Uh, they sit in the background and uh, usually offer up assistance and help whenever they can. Basically, uh, mentoring new uh, candidates that are going through the initi initiatory degrees. Uh, 
and just helping others uh, learn their different roles of parts. And if there's anything you do not want to answer, you can always say skip it or something. Okay. So, uh, why is the lodge dedicated to St. John? Well, there's actually two St. John's, uh, St. John the Evangelist and St. John the Baptist. Uh, they are the patron saints of uh, masonry. Um, they uh, run parallels to one another, both in Christianity and in the Masonic uh, uh, teachings as well. Uh, they're someone that we look for guidance and structure. And um, they're symbolized. Uh, there is a symbol that uh, represents the Saint, Holy Saints John. Uh, actually, it's a point within a circle, uh, the point being uh, the member or the brother, the circle representing uh, God, mankind, uh, to whom they serve. And then there are two parallel lines that uh, are embordered on that circle. One represents St. John the Evangelist and the other St. John the Baptist. And there's also a book of uh, uh, scriptures on the apex of that circle. It kind of denotes that we are uh, tied to our religious, our own religious convictions. Masonry is not a religion, but it is based on religion and a lot of the dogma and, and practices. But Masonry also encourages us to follow our own uh, religious path. It does not uh, dedicate or dictate, uh, you know, whether you're to be a Christian, a Jew, a uh, Hindu, Muslim whatever, uh, you can be of any faith as long as you believe in one deity. And uh, for us, uh, the Holy St. John kind of, uh, kind of ties that together right now. Discuss your Masonic journey. Well, I kind of alluded to it uh, before. Uh, like I said, I, I have a legacy. My dad uh, was a Mason. He's a past master. Both my uncles were past masters. I'm not quite sure. And I had other cousins that uh, were past masters uh, throughout the state of Indiana. My journey uh, took place. I, I was uh, raised in uh, 1975. That's been some time ago. Uh, I got involved with the Scottish Rite and the Shrine uh, immediately. My dad helped me through that. Uh, that was quite an experience. Uh, going through my uh, three degrees uh, in the Blue Lodge, my dad was my mentor and uh, he, he, he knew his ritual backwards and forwards. Uh, he's mentored a lot of other uh, people in his lifetime as well. Um, I was fairly active in the lodge uh, when I first moved up here. I'm originally from uh, the southern part of the state. And when I finally moved uh, into the area, um, I got affiliated with Whiting Lodge. But as a lot of us, life took over, uh, jobs, careers, uh, families, and so forth, they took over. And I found myself uh, not being able to attend. So approximately at that time, I did take a uh, demit from Lodge. If I couldn't, I felt that if I couldn't devote my, uh, sufficient time to the Lodge and spend time here and, and uh, help out and do whatever I can to support the Lodge, then I needed to uh, not unaffiliate, but uh, take myself out of the picture. And I did that for about 14 years. And then all of a sudden, I found myself living in Highland, Indiana, and uh, with my new job, uh, going back and forth. Uh, I was, For about a year or so, I kept driving by uh, this building, this temple here. And I kept saying to myself, you know, it, it, it kept talking to me. It kept saying, Bruce, you need to get back into this. You need to look into it, find out when the meetings are, uh, get yourself back involved, and get back to it. So I wound up, naturally, uh, Worship Brother Ben Hinton. I, actually, I called uh, bro Worship Brother Charles Graves first because he was the secretary at that time. Uh, I got information from him. I said, asked him how I could come, uh, go about getting affiliated with uh, Harbor Lodge and everything else. He gave me the directions. And then uh, I got to talking with uh, Worship Brother Ben Hinton, who... Uh, came and visited myself and my wife uh, and talked to us and uh, I submitted my application and uh, 
for affiliation and I was accepted and almost immediately I was put into an officer, a, a little office uh, to uh, help out, uh, help the lodge out. And I've been here since 2005. So right around that time I affiliated here and it's 2017 now. Uh, it's been the best thing that uh, I've done, one of the better decisions that I've made to get back and re-involved uh, with this institution. Uh, it's really assisted me and given me uh, support and comfort in times that I needed it. And I've rejoiced in the celebrations of the Lodge and, uh, and so forth. And I'm very pleased to say that I am a past master of the Indiana Harbor Lodge number 686. What has masonry done for you as a man, an employee, and as a philosopher? I think it's given me the guidance and the benchmarks and the road signs along the way. Uh, I, I've tried to uh, use uh, uh, the precepts of masonry in my daily life, in, in my job, in career. I, I'm a retired high school principal. And I've tried to use the philosophy and a lot of the uh, precepts that the uh, fraternity provides for us to live our lives and how to uh, deal with other mankind and how to serve them and serve God. Uh, I think it's improved me and I, it continues to improve me. Um, it's just like anything else. Once you start that uh, uh, journey, it never ends. It continues, uh, no matter whether you're at a, a spot such as myself that, that I'm retired from education, but yet I'm still involved with education. Maybe not at the same degree that I was, but I still am. And I believe that masonry is the same thing because the search for your own individual light in masonry never ends until the day you die. Uh, you're only seeking uh, uh, to improve yourself, to find out uh, those things that uh, those answers to questions that seemingly don't ha have answers to uh, your search for spirituality and where, where you uh, are supposed to be in the universe at that point in time. So consequently, I, I think it's a never ending journey and it doesn't end until your weary feet come to the end of their toilsome journey and from your nervous grasp drops the working tools of uh, life. Um, it, 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 it's, it's enriching. Um, and I, I, I just, uh, I, if I seem like I'm struggling for words, it's because I, I don't think there's any particular set of words that could truly describe what masonry does for an individual. And you can edit any of the idiotic crap that I'm spewing <laughs> too. Well, those are the best parts. <laughs> and I'm sure I'm going to have like an outtakes too. Yeah, thanks, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Blooper reel, <coughs> excuse me. What topics do you study in your free time? Well, Freemasonry, I, I've got several books that uh, I've collected over the years I, about Freemasonry, about George Washington, how it's impacted uh, the history of the United States and the, the development of the United States, uh, the development of uh, the world, uh, so to speak. Uh, again, I, I, I kind of like the historical aspects of it. I, I, I've done a lot of reading uh, to determine uh, the roots of uh, Freemasonry. Um, from Christopher Knight uh, and Robert Lomas uh, uh, and uh, all the other uh, usual books that you can find on Freemasonry. Uh, even on the internet, uh, I go looking for different things. Um, I like to do uh, woodworking and so forth. You know, it, it, it's just uh, it, it's it's just an interest of mine. Is there any life experience, wisdom you would like to impart to younger generations? Oh, jeez! Don't just say no. I know you got something. Uh, 
I, 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 as far as words of wisdom or knowledge that I impart, take life slow. Sometimes we, we get so caught up in the hectic day-to-day -day things and we get so involved with what we're doing uh, in our careers and our job that we forget what is truly uh, uh, meaningful in life and that's uh, stopping and enjoying and, and relishing uh, humanity, mankind. Uh, one of the things I think uh, that the that the uh, fraternity teaches us is tolerance. And it, uh, if I, I I'm not going to quote it right, but Dan Brown in his book, uh, 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 his last book, uh, he, he mentions the fact that Masonry seems to be the most democratic organization in the world because. When, a, uh, when people, when the members enter that room, you have people from all walks of life, from politi high-ranking politicians, high-power businessmen, to the lowly uh, laborer, to teachers, educators, uh, welders, whatever, whatever. Once you enter the lodge room, you are all on the same level. There is no class distinction. Uh, there is uh, no... Uh, 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 recognition of, uh, of status. Everybody has the same status once you enter the lodge room. And everybody has an equal uh, voice in the lodge room. Uh, and, and they're valued. And if we could take that type of philosophy, that type of culture, and spread that throughout uh, society, and, and, and I think that's one, one thing that we're charged with is to take that, uh, take those ideals and, and do exactly that and, and uh, teach tolerance, teach, uh, teach everyone how to interact and be humble and, and how to serve one another in a capacity that, that benefits everyone. Uh, not euphorically, but uh, it, 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 it needs to be in today's society, we need it more than, than ever to be able to sit down and, and um, just uh, be able to communicate and to be able to see one another's point of views and do it in an intelligent and rational manner. And that was a lot of rambling. Good stuff in there. That was question seven, by the way. I think it was 17 questions. Oh, shit. Okay. You're doing fine. <clears throat> Could you describe the relationships and bonds with your old and younger brethren? I think for everyone, it, 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 the bonds that, that you forge here uh, with the members of the lodge, some are going to be very strong. Because uh, some you, you're going to identify with it more readily and more deeply. Uh, but in general, I, I think the, the bonds or relationships with all the members, whether they be young or old, uh, they're, they're good bonds. Because you, the, the whole idea here is try to recognize the good in all people. And by doing so, uh, again, being a, a member for so long or whatever, uh, you may have a little bit more insight as to how to deal with uh, certain situations. Uh, the, the, the friendship and the brotherhood here are great. Uh, uh, whenever someone is in need, uh, the brotherhood it comes together collectively and, and shows the support for that individual uh, member and his family and so forth. Uh, the relationships, uh, like I said, that some will be stronger than the others, but uh, once you're a Mason, you're always a Mason. And no matter how strong uh, uh, or deep the bond goes, there still is that bond because you've all experienced the same thing. You've all felt the, uh, similar things, and um, you all share the same ideas and uh, thoughts. Uh,
Charlie, I sound like I'm full of shit. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering what I can add to it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's all good, good answer. Yeah. What would you like to say to men wanting to petition a lodge for membership? I would encourage them to, uh, to uh, join the membership. Uh, not, not so much as a social status or a status symbol type of thing, but if they truly are wanting to improve themselves and to gather more knowledge and to enrich their lives, just just you can enrich your lives just simply by sitting in on a degree because every, no matter how many times you sit on a, a, a degree, no matter whether it's an inner apprentice, fellow craft, or master mason, there's always going to be something, even though you've heard it a million times, there's always going to be something that at a mo in a moment's notice, it's going to strike a chord with you. It's going to turn that light bulb on uh, in your head and you're going to say, yeah, okay. Why did it take me so long to make that connection? And I, I, I believe that masonry will help those individuals who are seeking to improve and enrich their lives. I think it would help them even more immensely if they were become involved. And even if they just sat on the sidelines and listened to the ritual and watched it, uh, it, it, it would give them that insight. Uh, for improvement and enrichment. Uh, that, that, that's my message. If you're just going into it to be a knife and forker, or, that's fine too, if that's your goal. But if you're truly wanting to improve yourself and enrich your life, then this is the place to come. This is an organization that will give you that. Like I said, it, it supports your spirituality, it, it, it supports your inner self. Uh, in fact, it, it helps bring your inner self out in many uh, ways. And like I said, uh, there will be moments that, that that light bulb flashes on or flickers uh, for a moment and you'll, you'll make a connection of some sort. There will be, it will make a connection to something that, some event that happened in your life either early on or it's taking place right then and there. So uh, I would encourage them that if they want to enrich and improve themselves as a man, as a husband, as a father, as a servant to God and his country, this would be an excellent place for them to come. Nice words. Would you like your coffee? Could I take a quick? Yeah, yeah, take a little break. Charlie, how's he doing? Well, going fine, I'll tell you. Listen to uh, Bruce here, and he uh, he has made a pretty good study of it, better, better than I have. You know, one thing I could add is that uh, you can improve yourself in day street, but also when you do that, you can follow that along with your church membership and improve yourself there too. Well, believe it or not, they work together. Yep. Definitely. You can't be moral in one situation without being moral in the other. That's right. And, and again, masonry, it supports religion. It supports whatever faith that you have been raised in or that you believe in. It supports that faith. It does not look to take over and supersede it. It does not look to take over the world as everyone wants to think that we do. It, it is a support system, and it's an it's an ancient support system that's subsisted through time immemorial. So this is a good one. This is one of my favorite questions. Admission into masonry is achievable by any man, yet is exclusive. The structure of masonry can make a good man better. Will the quality of human life improve as the quantity of Freemasons rises? 
Theoretically, I would say yes, if I understand the question right. You, what, what the question is saying to me is, if we can get the quantity uh, membership up, that would mean that our teachings would rise exponentially by the membership. And you would hope and would think that by increasing your numbers and they, they having the same... Uh, uh, living the same philosophies and, and teachings and dogma and trying to improve themselves in their own lives individually, you would hope and think that a society would improve as well. Uh, but it's like anything else. You, the chain is only as strong as its weak, weakest link. And we all know historically, it, and, and not only in masonry, but in other organizations and other institutions, the membership, uh, you know, uh, it, it, the strength of the organization is, is reflected a lot of times in the membership itself. If you've got good quality people coming in and uh, attending to and doing what they're supposed to be doing, uh, then, then the organization is going to be extremely strong, respectful, and, and a benefit to society. But if you take that, or you can take that same organization, and if you get people in there that have ulterior motives, whether it be greed, uh, illegitimate uh, thoughts, uh, whatever, it, it, they start to deteriorate uh, uh, the reputation uh, of the, the organization and it demeans the importance of what's going on and uh, you know it, it, I would like to think the more people that we could get as members uh, that uh, we could improve society as a whole because that would tell me that our teachings are sound and well founded and that uh, our membership are doing what they're supposed to be doing that's improving themselves consequently they improve their home life in society's life as well. Sometimes we become corrupt. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, sometimes, and power a lot of times corrupts. And I think we see that in our politicians, uh, in our uh, political, more so today than ever. Uh, and I just wish that they would take, uh, even though they may have good intentions, they become corrupt and they get sidetracked and um, they go off in an opposite direction of what they should be. And that, that demeans it, that, that brings everybody down, that uh, degrades society. And again, I'm rambling. No, if you feel like you have more to say, just say it. I mean, okay. You'd be surprised. You know, Ben would say something, and you think, "Oh, that's silly. Uh, maybe you should cut that out." And then rewatch him, and he'll actually he'll like what he said. So yeah, if you feel like, just say it, and then we we show it to you later. And you're like, "Take that shit out of there." Then I'll cut it out. <laughs> maybe. Okay. <clears throat> So along with that, this like I'll, I arranged some of these questions so like the next one would be kind of similar to the last. Sure. So what do you think the public's opinion on Freemasonry is, and how would you like it to be perceived? Well, what I would like it be, uh, be perceived is uh, with dignity and honor and uh, respect uh, and the understanding that we're not here to uh, take over the world. We're not here to demonize and polarize people. We're here to make people better, make lives better. Uh, not, only, not only ours, but everyone's life, uh, irregardless of whether you're a member or you're not a member. It doesn't make any difference. We should be approaching uh, that with the same vigor and zeal uh, to improve everyone's station in life. Uh, but we all know that uh, over the years and even today, you have your opponents to masonry, you have your critics of masonry, you have those that feel that we're nothing but uh, Satan worshipers and, and uh, demon worshipers, and we're not. Uh, and it's unfortunate, and, and some of them are so steadfast in that belief that there's nothing that you can say or do that's going to convince them otherwise. And the only thing that you can do is uh, continue on and to live your life uh, to the best that you could possibly uh, uh, 
live it and, and to uh, uh, live out the teachings that are inculcated in our rituals and, and in our beliefs and our philosophies that all men are created equal and we should treat them a, a equal to one another as we do ourselves. Uh, but uh, that, that's the nature of society. You're always going to have your critics. And, and unfortunately, going back to something I said a little bit earlier uh, on the previous question, you know, uh, we've had members that have hurt our efforts. They've done uh, uh, things. They've done murder. They've done treason. They've done many different things that go against uh, er every principle and uh, philosophical idea that uh, the fraternity is about. And that in itself, and it only takes one person to commit one stupid act to take away years and uh, years of effort and, and trust and, and wash it down the tubes in a matter of seconds. Uh, and that's unfortunate. And, and like many other institutions, uh, we've had those people to, uh, to come along to do that. And it's hurt our image. And it, it still continue, continues to hurt our image. Uh, the Morgan incident, and there's a couple other people that, uh, one in particular I can't mention, but uh, they, 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 they've hurt the image of masonry. But you know what? It, it, it's astounding now. Even with all of that, with all the anti-Masonic uh, that went on in the early part of the uh, 20th century and the, uh, the latter part of the 19th century, all of the anti-Masonic uh, sentiments that went throughout the country were still here. We're still here. Mm -hmm. and, and we've grown and, and we've uh, rose uh, above uh, those incidents uh, as well. Uh, so that tells me a lot about the fraternity and the philosophy and the nature of the fraternity. Uh, it's strong and it's embedded. And even though we can only go back a couple of hundred years and really trace back our uh, historical roots, documented historical roots, it goes back even further than that, I believe. I, 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 and for a, a group or an organization, or a fraternity, whatever you want to call it, an institution, to subsist that long and still uh, rise above its downfallings. Uh, the, there's strong character to to the organization. Uh, it, it just means that our philosophy and our principles are strong and the values that we share with one another are even stronger and, and they can rise above any type of uh, obstacles that are presented to us, no matter what it is, no matter what it is. Good stuff, Bruce. Very good stuff. Again, I feel like I'm rambling and just shooting my mouth up. Mm -hmm. Hey, isn't it uh, one of the things on the steps? Rhetoric? Yeah. There you go. There's your rhetoric for you. Fulfilled that step. <laughs> yeah. It's Bush's bullshit. That's about what it is. Now you thinking. I This is one of my favorite questions because I'm the kind of guy that I'm, I'm a skeptical person and I. I, it takes a long time for me to, to earn respect for people and to trust what they say. So, being that said, uh, Freemasonry's history is preserved internally through thorough documentation and established trust among brethren. How can outsiders embrace and trust Masons while they are excluded from the fraternity? By the behavior of the Mason. You know, uh, tr trust has to be earned. Respect has to be earned. The only way that you, 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 you can talk about it, you can verbalize it, you can, uh, you know, your, your rhetoric can go on and on and on. But if your actions don't meet your words, then there's a disconnect. That's where, that's where the rubber meets the road. If your actions as a person don't match what you say in life, then you're a hypocrite. You're a, you're a bag of hot air. Uh, it, it, 
trust and respect come from not only telling someone that you're going to do something, but then you have to follow through and, and do what you say that you're going to do. You have to uh, live what you uh, speak. In other words, you got to walk the talk. Okay? And I, I don't care who you are, whether you're a member or a non-member, if you're going to tell somebody one thing and you turn around and do the complete opposite, there's not going to be any value for you whatsoever. There's not going to be any respect for you. There's not going to be any trust in you because they can't trust you to do what you say you're going to do. And, and uh, that that's, in my estimation, it's not so much the words, it's the action of the person. What is the history of Indiana Harbor Lodge 686? Well, I do know the history goes back uh, to uh, 1912. That's when it was first uh, chartered. Um, it uh, originated in, in uh, East Chicago. The building was originally in East Chicago. And in uh, about 19, and sometime in the 1970s, uh, they purchased this uh, property. I can't give you a specific date. But they purchased this property, built this uh, uh, temple, and they moved uh, the lodge here. Uh, so uh, our, our lodge has been around for 805 years. 800, or 800. 105 years. I'm sorry, cut that part out. 105 years. Uh, the other uh, interesting uh, uh, sidebar to that historical thing in that 105 or so years, 106 years, uh, we've had never repeated a worship master. We've never had the same master in the East twice. Uh, that speaks volumes, uh, 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 and I know many lodges throughout the state and even in uh, the Northwest Indiana uh, area uh, there's a lot of uh, members that have been uh, worshipful masters, and you know a, 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 that's a, a great distinction. They've been uh, worshipful masters of a lodge twice, some even more so. I I, I I don't know how many, but I know a couple of people that's been a master three uh, three times. And Indiana Harbor Lodge not repeating uh, having a, a master repeat his uh, time in the East. I, I think speaks volumes to to the brotherhood and uh, the acceptance of the members of Indiana Harbor Lodge over the years and how they've gotten uh, new and old members involved into uh, the lodge, whether it, getting them involved into uh, uh, offices immediately or giving them uh, individual roles during ritual or giving them uh, different uh, jobs or whatever. Uh, respecting those that can't uh, afford to dedicate the time and effort uh, to come to Lodge every week in, or, or sit in an office but are there to help us uh, during certain times of the year with uh, different events and activities and support us that way, uh, support us in bringing in new membership. It, it, it just, I, I think our historical background and the fact that We've been able to uh, bring new members in, get them totally involved and immersed and in, uh, interested in, in uh, the workings of the lodge, and just uh, just the camaraderie of uh, uh, the membership. Uh, Wednesday nights we have craft night. Uh, more times, even though that's meant to work on ritual, it's uh, meant to work on memorization for uh, the new candidates going through the degrees and the mentors. Some nights it's just a time where there's about a half a dozen, a dozen uh, so guys just sitting, uh, sitting down and shooting the, uh, shooting the bull uh, and, and telling stories on one another and uh, having a good time. I mean, I, Basically, a lot of what the success here at Harbor, I think it comes down to that, that people are willing to take time and just to uh, talk with one another and socialize and interact and be together. I mean, today um, in my class, uh, we were talking about 
uh, you know, family time, sitting down at, at, at dinner uh, with your family and interacting with your kids and teaching them how to uh, socialize and establishing a uh, culture or values with them, uh, that's getting lost today. In technology, partly, and I, I don't want to bad math, but, but that's <coughs> helped to kind of disintegrate that, that, that uh, time that we sit down and have a face-to-face -face, or, or time to take a, a, to sit down with one another and just talk about things, talk about values, talk about life, talk about what's going on with them. Um, we're so interested on in getting on Pinterest, on Instagram, on uh, this and that, you know, uh, yeah, it, it's all good stuff, but we got to learn to shut that stuff off at times. Uh, you know, as I was explaining to the class, you, you can get into a text message. You know, we, we like to communicate with one another like that, and it, that's good. But you have to understand, that's only two-dimensional. You're only reading what the person's writing in words. Now, you're, you're not looking at facial expressions. You're not looking at body language. You're not listening to the inflection and intonation of the voices. So you don't know exactly what the meaning of some of the things that are being said in a text message or on Facebook or anything else because, uh, because you don't have those cues, so to speak, to give you the idea as to what... Uh, uh, is trying to be in communicated to you. Uh, and, and that FaceTime with individuals is more meaningful than anything else. And, and I think that's where we've succeeded at Indiana Harbor Lodge because we do have people to, uh, to take that time and sit down and have the face-to-face -face and, and interact with one another on a one-to-one -one or even in a group situation. Um, People, it's too easy to make uh, accusations, criticize, bully, and so forth on social media because the person doing that has that amenity that they, there's nothing they can do to me because they can't touch me. I'm here in my bedroom on my computer and I can spew all kinds of hateful crap out there and nothing's really going to happen to me. Of course, as an educator, when the kids get back in the classroom and somebody's boyfriend gets upset because uh, some guy said something nasty about his girlfriend on Facebook, then we have a fight. That, that's when it, when it becomes a face-to-face. -face. And Charlie, that's $25. Yeah, I know. Still going. I ain't never paid it. <laughs> I ain't going to. <laughs> But uh, I kind of got off track. Uh, uh, but the, 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 those are a lot of things that I, I think are of value uh, for society, and I think that's what we've what we've captured here. And hopefully, that we'll never lose that culture of camaraderie and uh, sitting down and be able to talk with one another in a very meaningful way, face to face, without fear of being judgmental. Uh, or being chastised. You know, I'm kind of glad you rambled a little bit because you said some things in there that, that are very, you know, uh, they're still tied to the question, you know, uh, still tied to the concept of the lodge and, you know, that camaraderie that you sp spoke of during our practice nights. I mean, that is very important, whether you're actually practicing masonry or you're actually just sitting there and just talking to one another. Well, I, I think it goes, I mean, uh, it, it goes, uh, that type of thing goes beyond, yeah, it, it, what draws us together, uh, especially on Thursday nights, is doing the degree work and, and doing the businesses, at, uh, business at the state, I mean, but also, you know, welcoming uh, new initiati initiates into the uh, uh, fraternity, but, you know, it, it's got to, it gives the fraternity more substance. It gives it more meaning when we can sit down and, and even though we have that common ground, we can sit down and share ideas and thoughts and philosophies and we can agree and disagree and argue and fight uh, about our own opinions with other people, but we can do it in such a way where it's not um, adversarial, so to speak. 
And, and I think that's, even though that it may sound like it's not attached to our success, but I think that's probably one of our greatest strengths that promotes our success because we are able to pull these uh, people together and, and people feel comfortable coming here and sharing themselves with uh, others here. Because if they didn't, they wouldn't even come to our degree night. So, well, maybe they come for the food because we've been having good meals here lately. Like, you know. I also like talking to people face-to-face, uh, -face too, because if someone says something that they know you're not going to like, like, well, I got something right here for you, pal. Yeah. You know, you can't do that on the internet. You do that and you log off. And well, never uh, see again. Uh, that, that, that kind of cowardice allows you to say whatever you want, and even if you don't mean it, just to get a rise out of somebody and then... That's that, that, that's exactly what I was talking about, you know, with the cyberbullying and everything else. I mean, the person making those... Uh, uh, comments, the uh, uh, inflammatory comments, uh, they feel comfortable because they don't feel, uh, they, they have that amenity, they're safe, they're uh, invulnerable uh, to, to whatever is coming down the pike until you get face to face with somebody and then they uh, punch you in the nose because they, you, you really ticked them off and you said some nasty things and now they want a, a piece of your hide. and, and that's not what life is about. I mean, we're, you're always going to have your own ideas and thoughts and opinions. And you have a right to those. But you also have to recognize, along with that right, you have to recognize and um, uh, acknowledge other people's opinions, whether they are in conflict with yours or not. And, and because they have just as much right to those uh, ideas and opinions as you do to your own. Uh, you, we don't live in a vacuum. And, uh, but as long as we can do that peaceably and rationally and intelligently and civilized, then there should be, uh, should be any issues. But unfortunately, there are those times that it comes, at, well, look, look at the Middle East. That's been going on for centuries. And that's all over a piece of uh, a small piece of ground, and it's all over religious views. So, this is question fourteen. Any historical Masonic stories you'd like to share? No, I, I, I can't. It, it, it's always tough to say some kind of history if you don't have. So I know for me, I'm terrible with dates and geographical facts, so I'd have to read something off. But I mean, who knows? It, people have different kind of things that uh, they. Masa say. Uh, history in what terms? My own personal Masonic yeah, history. Yeah, like a story of a historical person you'd like to share, or something that maybe not a lot of people know that you'd like to bring up. Like George Washington, like to throw oh. axes. You know, who knows? Well, I was thinking more. Uh, 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 my historical or most memorable uh, uh, moment in history, it's not, uh, no one of, uh, of infamy or uh, fame. Uh, it's uh, my dad doing my degree work when I was an interference. He sat in the East for all three of my degrees. Uh, he raised me uh, uh, when I became a Master Mason. Um, one of his, his uh, one of his close cousins did the uh, apron lecture and the Bible lecture for me uh, in my degrees, and I think uh, to me that's my most memorable and historical Masonic moment uh, for me. Um, I do look at, at George Washington. Of course, I think everyone uh, picks George Washington as being. Uh, the prime leader uh, of uh, the Masonic movement here in uh, the United States. Um, but uh, I, Masonically, historically, uh, the day I was raised uh, by my dad was the most mem memorable and historic for me. Stories like that mean a lot to me. My dad's been dead for a few years. Uh, he wasn't a Mason. And really, he lived in Arizona for the last decade of his life with his wife. And, uh, you know, our, our time was few and far between. So when we did get together, you know, whether it was something we were doing 
I don't know, something interesting or just hanging around just mm -hmm. watching a movie. Like little moments like that will, will stick with me. And, uh, you know, when, you're, when your father is part of something that's meaningful to you, I mean, I'm sure that's got to be tremendous as far as like a moment in your life. Yeah. So thanks for sharing that. Then we have a couple interesting questions and then the final question. So can you, Bruce Bush, detect honesty? Can I detect honesty? I think in general I can. I think uh, I want to believe that in my interactions and what people are telling me are, are truthful. And um, I guess the way I go about it, I'll believe them as long as I find out differently. Meaning that if they at some point in time prove to me or demonstrate to me that uh, what they're telling me is untrue or they uh, it turns out that they are scamming me in some way we it goes back to that trust issue and respect issue uh, there's been a few times where I've held uh, uh, there's been a couple of people that I've held in very high esteem for a very long time and there's been an incident that it came about that uh, they deceived me, uh, and they they they've broken a trust with me. And once that trust is broken, uh, I don't care how much super glue or gorilla glue you uh, uh, put on that uh, piece of glass, uh, you're always know uh, going to know that it's been broken. The cracks always going to show and you're always going to look at it from a different perspective from that point forward i am a pretty trusting person and to a fault because sometimes i do i i put myself in situations where uh not that i've been horrendously uh, uh deceived or, or scammed but uh i i i i'm just trustful a person and, and uh, I, I take them at face value, and unless they do something or say something that, uh, to the uh, contrary, uh, I always have that trust. Uh, honesty. Sometimes you can tell when somebody's uh, uh, blowing you, blowing smoke. Uh, a lot of times you can, and I guess that's it. Comes from dealing with teenagers and listening to stories about uh, you know fights about thefts and other things that are being done in the classroom you can tell uh, when somebody is not telling you all the story or none of the story truthfully you ready for this one i guess is this the big one or what well this is one that uh I'm always interested to see, I know, out of all the questions, how you guys are going to respond. Okay. So, if you can comprehend the past, can you comprehend the future? <laughs> you can only guess at the uh, future, and it's a calculated guess based on the past. Uh, even though uh, history may be a dry, dull subject for many, uh, it's something that we should pay attention to because we can learn from our past and learn from our history and hopefully make a judgment or a calculated guess as to what the future might hold if we act in a similar way or if we act uh, in, in a different way that's, uh, uh, that would be more beneficial than what we did. Uh, basically, learn from your mistakes so that you don't make them into the future. <clears throat> to really foretell or foresee the future, I think we can only guess at it. Uh, sometimes you're, uh, you can hit the nail on the head. Sometimes you are way off the mark. Uh, but the only thing I can t tell you is, uh, by comprehending the past, you can only make a, a qualified, educated guess as to what the future would hold if you continue uh, that same type of behavior. Um, and hopefully we could use the uh, history of the past to change what the future might be. I 
I agree with a lot of that. When I asked uh, Ben, Ben talked a lot about the, the lodge, this particular lodge itself, and uh, how you know, he understood who came and went, and people coming in now, and where he thinks it's going to go. So it's good to hear another perspective on the question. That's why I like these questions. Is, you know, I don't know what anybody's going to say. Yeah. Next thing I know, I ask you something, and you're talking about school. Yeah. And it's, it's all good stuff. So finally... Well, I, th I, I think, okay. Uh, you have something else to add? Yeah, well, if I can, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, to that comment that you uh, said, that kind of goes back to what I uh, mentioned before. This lodge is made up of individuals coming from uh, different backgrounds and different careers and different pers perspectives. You know, what ben, how Ben sees it is based on his history, on his uh, experiences. What, how, what I'm giving you, the uh, whatever answers I'm giving you here is based on my experiences coming through what, what I've done in life. Uh, and that's what's unique about masonry is because we have the, uh, these people coming from all walks of life and they come from all different experiences and we can sit down and share those together. And, and at some point there is a connection. There is an intertwine. Maybe not dramatically, but the, there is a connection between between uh, uh, Ben's experiences and my experiences and Charlie's experiences, your experiences. Is that dying? That one blink. Yeah, it's not blinking anymore. Okay, I talk too much. I've already killed one camera. What have you yet to learn? What have I yet to learn? How to be a better man. A better husband, a better father, a better citizen. I'm still working on that. It's a work in progress. And like I said before, you never stop learning. You never stop growing. You never stop improving until you die. And then it's hopefully you move on to the next level and you're with a grand architect and you can learn what he knows, or at least part of it. That's it. Anytime an answer ends with death, I'm a happy guy. <laughs> I'm just kind of morbid like that. <laughs> well, yeah, that's it. So if there's anything else you want to add, just any topic at all you want to talk about corn roast, because Ben will talk about that all day. No, that's, that's the corn roast king. He is the man that initiated, implemented, created, Hold on. And start it chrome. He means this guy, Charlie Graves, the corn roast king. I had to run out and show him your photo on the wall that says corn roast king. Well, I'll tell you what, you can't be a king if you don't have the subjects. And the subjects have got to be behind you or you can't do nothing. You better shut this thing off. I don't know how to do that. <laughs>